Um, so the first bit is about um, ethical engagement and consciousness. I'm going to start by um, a quote from Jeremy Bentham, who in many ways is, could be considered to be a sort of founding father of um, artificial ethics or machine ethics, as it's often called. Um, there's a strap line in the machine ethics, um, machineethics.org uh, website uh, quoted from Bentham. Um, so here's, a, here's a, a quite famous quote, the bit in red, but I've added a bit of the, uh, a bit of the context. Um, and it's about what he calls the insuperable line, which is essentially the line between <laughs> creatures or entities which are worthy of moral concern and those which aren't. Um, and he says, what else is it that should trace the insuperable line? Um, is it the faculty of reason or perhaps the faculty for discourse? And then he goes on to say, the question is not can they reason nor can they talk, but can they suffer? Why should the law refuse its protection to any sensitive being? The time will come when humanity will extend its mantle over everything which breathes. Now that was 1789, just the year of the French Revolution, start of the French Revolution. And, um, well, in the 1970s, Peter Singer uh, wrote a book called Animal Liberation. He might well be thought of as the, um, in many ways, the heir of Jeremy Bentham's concern um, for the moral status of animals. And he coined the term speciesism, which is a kind of racism which um, he thinks um, affected people who didn't give um, animal suffering the same kind of moral consideration, comparing like with like, which obviously is a, an important issue, um, as one gives to human um, suffering, human experience, human consciousness. Um, on the subject of racism, I was, um, just as I was very impressed by Peter Singer when I read his book in, um, in the mid to late 70s, I was... Um, impressed by Aaron Sloman's book, uh, Computer Revolution in Philosophy. Um, Aaron, I think, is coming to the conference. I don't know if he's here today, but anyway. Um, this was from the, um, from the pr preface to his book, which is available on his website. Um, the book is, is sort of reproduced if you want to have a look through it. Um, most of the, and this is about um, the whether, if you like, whether machines, whether robots, intelligent robots... Um, should, should be um, considered to be on the ethical side of that insuperable line that Bentham referred to. Most of the discussions on both sides of this issue, those who think they should and they shouldn't, contain more prejudice and rhetoric than analysis or argument. I think this is because in the end there is not much scope for rational discussion on this issue. It's ultimately an ethical question whether you should treat robots like people or at least like cats, dogs or chimpanzees, not a question of fact. And that ethical question is a real meat behind the question whether artefacts could ever think or feel, at any rate, when the question is discussed without any attempt to actually design a thinking or feeling machine. When intelligent robots are made, and he says he's thinking maybe a hundred or a thousand years hence, um, some people will respond by accepting them as communicants and friends, whereas others will use all the old racialist arguments for depriving them of the status of persons. Did you know that you were a racialist. Um, so now I've got another quote here, which is from a, someone else who's actually um, here um, at the um, ASB conference, and it's a book which has only just been published or just about to be published, and it's by Murray Shanahan. And um, I met Murray uh, a couple of weeks ago, and also Aaron actually at a meeting in London, and um, Murray drew me. To, uh, drew attention to the fact that in the introduction to his book, he also deals with this link between uh, feeling, consciousness, and and ethics. Um, so I thought it'd be fitting to um, to give you his his um, sort of take on this matter. Why does the joy or the suffering of our fellow creatures matter? An animal's life is a succession of conscious experiences, and it's the character of those experiences, good or bad, that matters. The story of a brick makes no mention of such things. Consciousness is central to our humanity. It's what we care about most. The challenge is to explain what it is that allows conscious creatures to stand out in the way they do against the backdrop of the physical universe. And that's in a book which is um, about artificial consciousness, building um, neural models um, of, of artificial consciousness. Um, so there clearly is a lot of association uh, between consciousness and ethics, but articulating the link is hard. Um, 
I think it I think they need to be discussed more often within the same forum both in philosophical um, um, discussions and in AI cognitive science fora like this and particularly um, to do with um, questions of, about artificial agents um, so clearly there are important links between two, these two fields which have grown up in the last I don't know 10 uh, years or so <coughs> machine consciousness and machine ethics both of which have their own meetings and their own journals or uh, special issues of journals um, both of them have a strong and a weak form, as in, um, as, as in Searle's strong, weak AI. Um, both of them raise questions about the role of cognition in their respective <coughs> domain. And, um, both, and, there, and the, there is this important question of whether ethical status in a machine, if a machine is to be given ethical status, whether that in, necessitates granting that the machine has consciousness in some way and also the, the reverse question of whether um, granting the, a machine consciousness involves granting it ethical status and um, there is a widespread assumption amongst many people that um, there's a difficulty about AI in relation to um, in relation to consciousness um, at least if one is using present-day methods because um, artificial agents can't have qualia um, qualia being that technical term that's used to mean states which have a uh, which have a sort of um, a, a sensation quality rather than a cognitive uh, quality. Um, so um, again, looking at um, something that Aaron um, has said. In fact, he he, he mentioned it at this at, in his talk at a meeting a couple of weeks ago, which helped to fuel my my pr um, present you know my construction of this talk. Um, he was interested in the question: um, Could artificial agents have qualia in any sense and he had an, um, an interesting argument to show that that you had to grant qualia to to um, any perceptual agent that was capable of <coughs> being able to register the flipping of, a, of an ambiguous uh, presentation like a necker cube or a vase face um, uh, picture um, because um, the um, the the uh, there is no difference when when the when the uh, the presentation is experienced as flipping. There's no difference in the actual external physical um, physical uh, image. Um, so therefore, something must be going on internally, and that could be called um, a quale or a set of qualia. And uh, uh, Sloman argues that um, in fact robots will have plenty of qualia, affective as well as cognitive. And this is um, just a um, an example of one of the many diagrams he uses to il illustrate his cog COGAF, cognitive affective model um, of multiple virtual machines and so on. So, we're in, so Sloman says we're entitled to assume the robot has perceptual quality because of the lack of a change in the internal state <coughs> relative to, uh, sorry, of the change in the internal state relative to lack of change in the outward um, display. Um, but I think... Um, I'm happy to agree with this that there that we can talk about qualia in this kind of a case, but there are qualia and qualia, and um, I think it's important to see that the, there is a kind of qual of qualia which um, involve something more directly linked with ethics, and so I want to distinguish between functional qualia and phenomenal qualia, and say that that um, uh, what Aaron is describing need only be functional qualia. Um, so um, phenomenal qualia, on the other hand, involve um, qualia or consciousness in an ethically engaging sense. And, um, you know, in, in, in really to say, to talk about a robot as having qualia in virtue of its um, perceiving the flip in, a, uh, in an ambiguous uh, presentation is not to talk about what it's like to be um, that robot or to experience it in some in some uh, rich phenomenal sense that involves um, an ethical uh, an ethical dimension and it's that ethical dimension which is the critical criterion uh, for Bentham um, and puts it on the on the on the ethical side of that of that line so the question arises whether if robots are built today um, using today's techniques could they have phenomenal qualia or funks as I call them as opposed to funks um, now um, you know, clearly 
some people are worried about this, and, and here's a quote from Dan Dennett, um, some, you know, just over 10 years ago, talking at the Royal Society about the COG um, programme, um, where he wrote that um, more than a few participants in the COG project are, are already musing, or maybe they're not anymore, about what obligations they might have to COG over and above their obligations to the COG team. And maybe, you know, if they had had the distinction between uh, funks and fenks, they, they might have thought, well, maybe COG can only have funks and not fenks, and therefore maybe ethical issues didn't arise. But that's just my gloss, and, you know, people may well disagree, and I'm happy to hear what people say. Now, I'm not saying that there can't be artificial phenomenal qualia or fenks. There could be artificially created beings in the far um, future that use techniques we have only the faintest glimmer of, at the moment, and they could be regarded and probably will be regarded as having phenomenal qualia and ethically engaging states without question. Um, humanoids uh, constructed or grown from artificial genetic material, artificial DNA or something like that, derived from um, new synthetic chemistries, for example. Um, if they had that kind of organic um, set of organic properties, um, they, they would be artificial for sure. They would be very unlike present-day artificial intelligence systems, although their design or, or their, their uh, development may owe an enormous amount to the work being done in artificial intelligence today and that's been done over, um, over you know, the last few decades. Um, and we would, cons I think, we, so it's possible to imagine um, artificial agents um, where we would consider it without question that they, their states are ethically engaging and involve us in kind of obligations towards them on pain of um, a certain kind of speciesism or, or racism. The question is, where are we today in relation to them? If we put those creatures um, sort of at the far wall, as it were, or near the far wall, um, you know, so they're actually quite close to real humans as we are today, um, where would um, sort of AI agents today fit? Would they be sort of in the middle? Would they be, you know, further towards the edge? Or would they be right down here or, you know, almost um, at that far wall? You know, how much progress have we made today? I mean, that's a, that's a sort of question I think we need to ask ourselves. Well, so I assuming that, 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 you know, artificial agents don't have consciousness um, in any, ethi in, 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 in any um, sense that involves... Uh, phenomenal qualia, could there never thus be some kind of ethical engagement with them, perhaps of a, a lesser kind? Um, so just to focus our intuitions, um, I'd like to consider a, a movie that, that I uh, thought was quite nice when I first saw it, um, Bicentennial Man. I think it may be on the programme for being displayed um, during, the, uh, during the session here, uh, during our visit here to Leicester. Um, so this is about a humanoid robot acquired by a rich Californian lawyer as a household assistant that has some kind of unique design that um, has a fairly sort of random elements and it's produced in it some very special learning capacities that the other members of this particular production line didn't possess and it, it's endowed the robot with delicate creative manipulative capacities that enables it to, to uh, create these very um, exquisite um, uh, wood uh, objet d'art um, out of driftwood which are collected from the seashore um, and well um, Andrew develops complex empathetic relationships with family members and also his the decorative products become sought after collectors items which are sold for you know thousands of dollars and uh, money starts flowing into the the Martin household and um, his owner decides that he ought to have the legal right to have a bank account of his own and own, own property in his own right, even though he's still deemed to be a machine. And being a, 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 an influential lawyer, he's able to get that passed um, by the state leg legislature. Um, then, you know, Andrew comes into conflict with his owner because he's got a fairly old-fashioned idea to, uh, of ownership and refuses to give Andrew his freedom. Uh, but eventually he, Andrew, goes off and builds his own house and moves out to live there and goes through a number of other um, interesting transformations, but they don't need to concern us here. Eventually ends up in a state that probably is very much like that, um, you know, being over there at the far end of the wall. Um, but while we're, we're talking about someone, you know, who's back here, as it were, at this end, and uh, let's assume he, he's not conscious at the stage where he becomes a property owner, although that's not made totally clear in... 
um, in the story. Um, um, but arguably his ownership of property provides him with not just legal but also moral rights in this sense that it would be morally wrong to walk into his house and make off with his possessions. At least you might, you know, you might like to argue that as a kind of objection or counterexample to the claim that, that um, you need to have consciousness in, either to, in order to have this kind of ethical status. So even if you admit that Andrew is just a zombie in the sense that he maybe has functional qualia but no phenomenal qualia, he still has got um, this kind of, uh, we have a duty to not just arbitrarily go in and appropriate his, his possessions. Um, well, I leave that as a question you might want to think about. Um, ideally, you know, we could have a 10-minute discussion here, but we don't really have uh, time for that now. Here's another kind of approach to this, which also um, takes for granted that we're talking about relatively simple agents that, that are, you know, that can be considered to be zombies in the sense that they don't have uh, phenomenal qualia. They may still qualify for moral consideration in the weak sense. Um, this, is, this comes from the work of a a Dutch philosopher, Mark Kochelberg. Um, so he says that even when there's no question of their having phenomenal states, um, it's, if they pr um, are entering into a sufficiently rich set of social interactions with humans in contexts where there are empathetic, effective responses um, and where the robots are capable of mirroring what he calls the vulnerabilities of their uh, human interactors, then he thinks that we would naturally tend to have a kind of moral identification uh, with these um, robots, possibly in, you know, somewhat in the sense that Aaron Sloman was, was, was identifying in, that, in, in the passage I read from his, his book. Um, and so that's another case which challenges this neat sort of division between moral status and, and possessing consciousness. So it's not that I want to say that, that it's a very clear uh, uh, sort of dividing line. Even so, I think these are sort of weaker kinds of moral consideration um, ba based on special cases, legal status or the ease of social identification that we have with, with these particular, um, you know, very empathetic uh, robots, empathetic behaving robots. And there's still the Bentham test. Do they suffer? Are they capable of suffer, of suffering, which I think gives them, uh, you know, a hard, you know, is a, is a much harder <coughs> test for them to pass. So at this point, I've been talking a lot about a particular conception of ethical status. And obviously, there's another important notion of ethics that comes in when we're talking about ethical machines. So I just want to clarify um, the difference between these two. Um, so there are two different ways that you can talk about an entity as being a member of the ethical constituency, one of which is the, is the, is the sort that Bentham had in mind, which is something associated with capability of suffering and maybe having other kinds of rich um, experiences, affective states, positive or negative. Um, and I call that being an ethical consumer, or if you like, an ethical patient, roughly being potentially the subject of moral concern or roughly having uh, moral rights. But on the other hand, you can be an ethical producer or an ethical agent um, uh, in, this in this specific sense, that is being a source of morally valuable action or roughly having duties which you may or may not fulfil. So here, here are sort of, you can have um, certain entities which may or may not be considered to be moral consumers or may or may not be considered to be moral producers. So chickens might, um, on, the, on the one hand, be considered as just objects and not, and not moral not having moral status at all or they may be considered as moral consumers or then possibly even considered as moral producers in the sense that maybe their source of morally valuable actions such as maybe they have duties to lay eggs for us and uh, provide us with food i don't know whether that would count in a very in some very vague sense but that's really a joke but <laughs> um but uh thanks thanks for laughing um so um you know, obviously, we've talked mainly about um, artificial ethical consumers up to now, and that's of intense theoretical in interest. It's one of those questions that's a bit like a candle flame that moths, um, you know, sort of automatically go and uh, fly towards. And I think we're in the AI community; we do that. We 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 automatically gravitate to that kind of a question. But this, there's this other question, and this other question raises more immediate challenges perhaps, which is to do with artificial ethical producers. I hope I've made it clear that the sort of distinction I have in mind between those two 
kinds of um, ethical status. And also, in any case, we need to work out the relation between the two. Um, so that's something that I'm going to sort of try to develop. You know, just a little bit more about, the, if you like, the philosophical um, underpinnings of, the, of these two kinds of, of ethical status. You can see them as having a kind of complementary direction of fit. Um, so something can be a target for morally valuable action or concern, in which case it's a sort of moral consumer, um, or else it can be a source of morally valuable action, in which case it's a, uh, it's a moral producer. And that's really a, a sort of two complementary directions in which that moral agent, considered as a sort of being in its own right, um, it, it, the relation it, it holds towards the moral community, considered the, as the totality of moral agents. Um, in a, a less misleading way of looking at it is, is like that, where the moral agent is actually sitting inside the boundary of the moral community, but with the, the two arrows pointing in the opposite directions. Um, okay. Now, clearly, um, you, can, you can occupy both roles. You can be both a moral consumer and a moral producer at the same time. So if I'm in an accident, if I, you know, if I was in the, the Haiti earthquake, I'm, I, I would need help, sympathy, and so on. So to that, you know, in that respect, I'd be a moral consumer. But maybe if I was less uh, badly injured than many of the others, I would be helping out those worth, worse off than me, in which case, of course, I'd be a moral producer. Uh, um, moral producers don't have to be actually good you know, guys doing the right thing. Um, you can be a pretty evil sort of, you know, you can be a murderer, a thief or whatever and still have the status of a moral producer. It's just that the actions you, you're performing are ones which are negatively evaluated rather than positively. So just to, that's just to kind of clear up a couple of issues about how these two terms um, interact. Um, now, being a moral consumer doesn't seem to entail being a moral producer, um, despite my sort of crack about the, uh, the chickens, I think most people would say that chickens are, are much more clearly moral consumers than they are moral producers. And human infants uh, don't seem to have many duties, although maybe they're growing into beings that have duties. And we might want to uh, think of them as moral producers um, in that um, secondary sense. Um, what about the other way around? Um, is it possible to be a moral um, uh, producer without being a moral consumer. Um, now, I think it's part of the sort of, um, the kind of underlying assumption of the artificial ethics um, work program that um, being a moral producer is something which you can at least model in fairly rich ways and maybe even produce um, something approaching a genuine moral producer in a kind of strong machine ethics sense without it's necessarily having to be a moral consumer in the sense of having consciousness or, you know, some kind of ethically engaging state like that. So, um, you know, maybe you could be a funky robot rather than a, also a funky robot um, and at least have something like ethical intelligence without having the kind of feeling that goes with this other sort of moral status. So maybe you can have the capacity for moral production even if not the capacity for um, some kind of ethically significant um, moral consumer state. Well, that's at least, you know, um, an assumption I want to sort of look at. So now we're on to um, ethical intelligence and, and AEI, artificial ethical intelligence, which is to ethical intelligence what um, AI is to general intelligence. Um, and, you know, does the problem of making an artificial moral agent or in the sense of a producer, equate to the problem of developing an artificial agent with, with ethical intelligence? Is that all you need? Is, you know, can, you know, is, is our status as a, as a morally productive being, a morally responsible being, um, equate to having certain kinds of intelligence as opposed to other sorts of properties? Um, now, people, many people working in the field of machine ethics seem to see their research tasks that way. In other words, um, ethics as a kind of knowledge domain which can be modelled and maybe then replicated in the way that expert systems have done so in uh, domains like medicine, law and so on. Um, so a theoretical issue for AEI um, is what role intelligence plays and how exclusive a role is it? Um, is it all there is to ethical productivity and how far you know, other factors that might be thought to be involved like effective 
factors, phenomenological factors, embodied factors, social factors, and others um, may be either dismissed or, or um, you know, reinterpreted in some cognitive intelligence-based uh, terms. And I think that a lot of the discussion uh, um, in this area is based around that, that, those sorts of issues. Um, now, there's also a practical issue involved in, in um, artificial ethical intelligence, which is to do with what might be called providing a, an ethical scaffolding for, um, uh, for, for autonomous agents. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about agents as having more and more autonomy in, in a sort of operational or functional sense. They're increasingly making their own decisions in all the various spheres in which they're operating. And um, maybe operational autonomy slides into a kind of ethical autonomy. And this is a growing practical issue as um, robots proliferate. Um, and when they stop being simply in the research labs and go out into production lines, if they do, and start proliferating the way that, that our cell phones um, have proliferated, it will be a very, very important issue to, you know, whether they have um, ethical autonomy or ought to have ethical autonomy. And many people are saying that we need to ensure that such agents behave in ways that are um, ethically acceptable, within acceptable ethical bounds, and therefore their control systems have to be appropriately ethically scaffolded. And therefore, um, you know, the, 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 the task of machine ethics takes on a, a very urgent practical, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, well, a practical urgency. If you think about the time it took for one of these to stop being the size of a brick and become what it is um, in terms of size, in terms of, um, in terms of um, I mean, mine's pretty old-fashioned now, but, you know, um, th we won't have much time once they start, be you know, once we get uh, a robot in every home or whatever, which is what South Korea were um, proclaiming for 2010. I don't know if they're, if they're going to make it. But. So, um, so you can see that there is this issue of how do we extend artificial intelligence to be artificial ethical intelligence so that we're not just talking about um, ethical, um, the ethical practice of artificial intelligence, but um, artificially intelligent agents which have their own ethical responsibilities built into them in some ways. Well, there are many you know, current approaches to developing machine ethics or artificial ethical intelligence. And they involve different kinds of philosophical paradigms for ethics, utilitarian, Kantian, virtue ethics, prima facie duties, and others. And there are a number of AI techniques or cognitive techniques that have been used uh, based on deontic logic, case-based reasoning, inductive learning, neural network learning, um, simulation of, of global sp uh, use of global sp workspace models, um, use of e evolution, um, virtual embodied agent populations, I haven't got a name against that, but um, simulated brain architectures, uh, modeling um, affectivity, and so on. Um, this isn't primarily a, a technical talk, so I'm not going to talk about those in any detail, but you can see there's a variety of different methods, some of which have different assumptions, and some of which involve some of those other aspects besides mere intelligence considered in a, in a um, very uh, limited sense. Um, but all of which are recognisably projects within, um, within artificial intelligence using um, you know, current techniques. Um, so now the question, let's go back to this question about consciousness and look again specifically at the question of ethical status, um, how the role that consciousness might play in, um, um, in, in the ethical status of moral producers. Um, so do you need... Um, the phenomenal qualia to be a real moral produce, producer. Um, you know, so people might say, don't you need to be conscious to be a genuine moral producer, just as you might um, do so to be a, um, a genuine moral agent. I mean, if you think about, say, if you're trying to teach a kid, um, you know, give a kid a sort of sense of, of, of right and wrong, um, and supposing Tommy sort of hits, um, hits his friend over the head with a, a toy hammer, um, you might say something like, "Well, look, how do you, how would you feel if you were, you know, if you were Jane and had just been hit over the head, and you know, and you can see Jane's crying, you know, how would you feel if you were in pain, like she's obviously, you know, in pain, and you you, you try to get Tommy to, you know, empathetically 
um, think of Jane's state from the inside. So this idea of, of, of you know, projecting into the consciousness of another person who may be affected by your, um, your, your actions is obviously important to being to our conception of what it is to be a moral agent if you think of it in terms of that sort of you know obeying a kind of golden rule or person respecting sort of approach which is fundamental to much ethical thinking so empathetic understanding of the experience of others seems to be an important part of moral insight and um, you know maybe you thought well to understand this in a real sense involves something more than just some kind of intellectual um, activity or something of a sort that, uh, you know, a non-conscious agent, um, however, quotes effective its architecture might be, um, couldn't really properly grasp if it has never had, if it hasn't got the capable of being directly acquainted with, you know, states of pain or suffering or, you know, uh, fear or whatever. So, um, you know, such a being would be a kind of non-participating agent um, in, 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 in the moral game, if you like. Um, a eunuch in the moral harem, as you might say. Um, so um, now, in fact, um, you know, building or developing general, mor sorry, genuine moral agents is not really taken as a serious target for all sorts of reasons. It's, fact, it's possibly so far down in that direction, as it were, um, in, in, in current machine ethics or uh, artificial ethical intelligence research. The people really want to just produce useful models of moral agency, partial or approximate, or workable moral scaffolds for autonomous agents, no doubt informed by the best research in ethical theory and philosophy and in psychology and neuroethics and so on. Um, so, you know, clearly there's a question of the pragmatics of machine ethics. Um, so... AEI or machine ethics is actually seen in quite a pragmatic way by many people. And here's a quote from um, a recent book on uh, <coughs> machine ethics, which is um, uh, by Wendell Wallach and Colin Allen, which I recommend to you. Um, and they write, it doesn't really matter whether artificial moral systems are genuine moral agents. And I think they're having this kind of idea in mind that I you know, this kind of objection in mind. The engineering objective remains the same. Humans need advanced robots to act as much like moral agents as possible. So really it's the behaviour that counts rather than, you know, what, 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 you know, whether they really have got these kind of empathetic or conscious states that enable them to really gen genuinely empathise. Um, all things considered, advanced automated systems that use moral criteria to rank different courses of action are preferable to ones that pay no attention to moral issues. Okay, so that's a kind of pragmatic uh, rationale. And clearly there are lots of different roles for full-blooded moral agents. Um, they can be used as models, they can be used in moral decision support, moral education, they you know, can be used um, as part of uh, safety, safety critical constraints um, in various morally sensitive situations. They can be used as, you know, agents of, of quasi-personal interaction, which I've already talked about. Um, Inter-robot moral relations obviously involves um, modelling ethics. So these are ways in which one can have sort of, you know, moral agents, which are models of moral agency without being considered to be full-blooded moral agents in various ways. But the, the question arises is, if one is only using rather impoverished approximations to full ethical agency, if that's the only kind of thing you can have, at least for a full time, uh, for a long time, may, th may you know, this kind of building ethics into um, such systems be worse than useless, in, at least in some, um, perhaps many, real live situations. A little artificial ethics um, might be considered to be a dangerous thing. Um, so that's really, you know, uh, I think an important consideration um, that, um, you know, maybe people might like to comment on. Um, okay, so I'm just going to sort of um, coming to, towards the end of what I wanted to present. But the last thing is, you know, the question, just take head on this question of how far ethics can be treated as an intellectual domain. And the way I want to do this is to look at AEI <coughs> in a sort of historical context and rather than looking at what the, you know, what's actually happening now, try and look at uh, some points in the history of thinking about ethics um, 
and look at some of the historical figures. Um, now Kant maybe would have seen um, ethics as very much an intellectual enterprise. Locke and Bentham certainly would be. And I want to just start by looking at, uh, at John Locke for a minute. There's this great quote from um, Locke's essay concerning human understanding published in 1690. So if Bentham was a sort of ancestor of, of ethical AI or artificial ethics, um, I think Locke is an even earlier ancestor. And Locke says quite, um, quite sort of straight that really ethics, when, once you, 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 you sort of uh, get away from all the emotional issues that, 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 that affect um, you know, our, our thinking about ethics, you really get a set of self-evident truths um, so ethical thinking becomes very much like mathematics. And he says that, I doubt not, but from self-evident propositions by necessary consequences as incontestable as those in mathematics, the measures of right and wrong might be made out to anyone that will apply himself with the same indifferency, which I think means in present-day terms detachment, and attention to the one as he does to the other of these sciences. So for um, I think Locke would be probably be a friend of, of, of um, much um, work in this area. Now Bentham, going back to Bentham, apart from his role as, as a sort of friend of the, uh, the ethics of animals, um, he developed something which he called the philosophic calculus. And so he might be seen as a role model. In fact, he is seen as a role model by many machine ethicists. Um, the philosophic calculus was designed to compute the value of a given act in terms of its likely generation of felicity and misery. And it was expressed as a kind of algorithm, also as a poem, which I might display at the end. Um, basically, he had a sort of procedure, a decision procedure, for mor morally evaluating acts. So an act would get a score depending on its production of pleasure and pain using a variety of parameters. I'm not quite sure how these interacted, but it would be, you know, fairly you could kind of comparatively weight them in different ways. So intensity, how strong the pleasure and pain is, how long um, the sensation lasts, how likely the expected result, how soon the result would follow on from the, um, from the action, how likely it is to lead to further pleasures, the freedom from mixture with the opposite quality. Um, is it an unalloyed pleasure or an unalloyed pain? Um, the breadth of distribution of the resulting pleasure or pain across the population of sentient beings, which obviously is crucial for, um, for ethical thinking. All the others will affect sort of selfish, prudential thinking as well as um, ethical thinking. Now, um, you know, I mean, I put that up to, because you can see that, you know, moments reflection will see that there are many weaknesses to this, uh, this kind of approach. It does lend itself to some kind of computational form. But, um, you know, even within his lifetime, Bentham's view was attacked as being crude and brutish precisely because it did so easily allow itself to be systematised in a kind of algorithmic form. And for many critics, you know, this kind of theory simply rides roughshod over the many subtle and ineffable aspects of moral valuation and appreciation. And if we turn to a much older tradition of thinking about ethics um, in Aristotle, uh, for example, we see that there's a completely different approach to what it is to be a moral agent. So if, if one's a, um, a machine ethicist and one is reading Aristotle rather than Locke or Bentham, one would perhaps be, um, one, one's task of modelling um, moral agency would be a much more Herculean task. Um, Aristotle talks about phronesis or practical wisdom and his, pic his picture of a, a virtuous or a, practical, a practically wise person, a phronimos, as he calls it, um, do, uh, doesn't so readily lend itself to an AI um, treatment, perhaps. Um, so here are some of the sort of elements of phronesis or, or arete, moral virtue, um, as for, as that can be extracted from an Aristotelian um, account, as um, many um, current-day writers have written about this. I mentioned um, Sean Gallagher in the previous uh, slide. Um, so uh, a, 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 phrono, a phronimos, uh, a practically wise person, would have to be trained by good upbringing, would keep good company, would have practical experience in, in the concrete real world of good action in real situations, would have well-balanced emotions, habits, character, um, would have um, human interaction, rich human interaction with a rich form of self-awareness which is socially embedded 
uh, would have skill at dealing with particular situations um, rather than applying just a sort of intellectual um, set of rules. And this um, process of, of moral, uh, of practical wisdom would be a, a lifelong practice, would involve a lifelong pursuit. It wouldn't be something that would be developed in a very, in a, in a short time. Now, people, you know, are doing work in machine ethics with a view to this kind of, um, you know, some of, some of these, uh, bringing some of these qualities in, using a kind of bottom-up, learning-based approach, um, socially embedded kind of approach. But um, clearly these sorts of qualities don't fit um, into relatively simple AI models. And if this really does provide a much truer picture of uh, what I'm calling moral production or moral agency, then um, clearly the task um, of morally scaffolding um, our artificial agents is going to be a much harder one um, than might be thought from a, a, a very rapid uh, con, you know, consideration of, of, uh, of the issue. And then finally, um, there's a the problem that morality itself can be put under the critical spotlight in various ways. I just mentioned one way here. There are others, but I didn't want to bring in too much because of time. Um, there are some philosophers who see our moral predicament as continually prone to presenting us with insuperable ethical dilemmas by which they mean um, that they're not just hard to choose between you know, the two or more um, horns of the, of the dilemma, but where no outcome is, is an, an admirable or a right or correct or defensible outcome and where whatever one chooses, one does wrong. One cannot you know, let oneself off the moral hook of having um, you know, done the wrong thing. Um, here's an example just drawn from a recent news item um, about a month, a month and a half ago. A TV journalist um, <laughs> revealed on a local uh, news network, which, which then I think had na national coverage, um, that, that some years ago, maybe 10, 20 years ago, um, he, he had kept a promise to his gay lover friend um, who had AIDS that um, if it got too unbearable and, and his friend wanted his, his life to be, um, to be ended, that he would, uh, he would, he would uh, do it. And um, he, well, the doctor was um, out of the room in the, in the hospital ward. Um, he got a pillow and put it on the, on the guy's head. And, um, you know. and he revealed this you know, 10, 20 years later. Um, and um, clearly it was something that, that was a very difficult situation, which, whichever he did, he would lose. Um, there was, you know, he couldn't just, just say, well, I chose to do that and I defend it and it's the right thing and I have no guilt. He couldn't but feel remorse for it, whichever way he did. And that shows that, in fact, you know, morality isn't necessarily something that even humans, even practically wise people are good at doing because the situation may just, the world may just deal us lousy cards and there just may be no admirable way of, of working with that with that set of cards, um, and frequently does uh, deal as cards like that. And in fact, a lot of ethics is like that. Um, so on this view, we can't even say that morality is something that humans do well at, let alone machines. Um, and maybe in, in a sense, none of us are, hu are experts at, at, at ethics. And ethics in that sense is just a bitch. You know? <laughs> and um, that makes it even harder to launch a kind of AEI approach of, of, of sort of simulating ethics or, or modelling ethics as something that we're good at and we should try and get machines to be good at. So summing up, um, you know, here are some of the things I've sort of touched on. Um, the idea of extending the moral community or constituency, I've talked about the, you know, the way that can be done to machines, but also in relation to how people have thought about doing that to animals. Um, the, the, how that um, is based on consciousness and the possible entanglement between ethics and consciousness and trying to, to look at some of the, the um, strands in that entangled relation. And I distinguish between qualia of one sort and qualia of another, functional qualia and phenomenal qualia. Um, I then distinguish between these two different kinds of uh, moral status which have to be um, you know, separated out but then related carefully to one another, moral consumption versus moral production. Um, and then I concentrated on moral production or ethical agency 
um, and ask how far is ethical agency open to a sort of effective AI model. I looked at the fact that um, there seems to be a kind of urgency given the, uh, the way the autonomy of our artificial agents are developing um, to, to develop various kinds of moral scaffolds for autonomous agents and you know, discuss the, the work of machine ethics in relation to that sort of in, you know, very practical task. But I raise the, the issue that maybe um, you know, if there are only rather limited approximations to, to real ethics, as it were, it could be quite a dangerous thing. And then I discuss you know, maybe a kind of moral calculus-based approach to ethics, to a, a sort of Aristotelian practical wisdom-based approach, which makes the task much harder. And then finally, a point I only mentioned very briefly in passing, there is this issue of proliferation, which seems to me one of the most important uh, questions that I think as, as AI professionals um, or as AI developers, we need to be constantly aware of. And this is more an, about the ethics of doing AI, um, irrespective of its, um, you know, whether it's got a, a content in the way I've been describing that um, we think of ourselves as doing it in, in a very limited way in the research lab, but um, good, you know, good AI de designs then um, spread really rapidly um, across the world, uh, across a whole universe of users, and um, then it's too late. And um, if we're going to do something about ethics in our autonomous agents, we've got to think about it hard now before it's too late. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. okay, we've got about uh, 10 minutes for questions, although Steve's indicated to me he will carry on if there are more further questions after that. Um, I'm just going to, um, sorry, yeah. put up uh, Bentham's little poem. Yes. People might have like that. Anyway, Good. yeah. yeah. Could you add just a little bit? You talked about the ethics agent, the ethics robots ought to have, or creatures ought to have. Do you want to talk about the ethics of whether there are any robots we should not make? Well, um, yeah, I mean, one thing I was going to say, but I, um, I kind of backpedaled on it, is, um, you know, this question of moral scaffolding. I mean, obviously, you know, you can present it as, well, do we build moral scaffolds into our, into our artificial agents or don't we? Or do we just carry on, you know, regardless, you know? And obviously there is a third possibility that we, and this is where the issue of proliferation comes in, maybe we should be, you know, taking a, a much a harder, a more critical look um, at the whole activity of, of um, you know, cognitive technology. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm just, I would be just one person, uh, you know, um, crying in the wilderness if I, if I were to say that. Um, but, you know, clearly it is an important issue. Um, I don't see there's much point in kind of sort of um, just moaning on about it. Because if, if, clearly the excitement of doing research uh, in AI is, is palpable and, and, very and, very, and very attractive and exciting. Sorry, um, very, very, um, you know, addictive. Um, but uh, I, think, I think in general it is an important point to make that, um, you know, when one does research, you, one doesn't think too much about what will happen when, you know, uh, my, my products become so good that they're taken up by governments, by corporations, and then mass-produced. And, you know, the people who designed the first motor cars didn't think too much about roads and, you know, and, and um, global warming and so on. We've got killer robots and sexual companion robots in production now. When yeah. should we start thinking about it? Yeah, yeah. I think, I think we should start thinking about it about 50 years ago. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I read, uh, so you spoke about um, more of producer and more of consumer. Yeah. Now, my, my question is, how can you be uh, only a moral producer in the sense that if you don't inspire empathy, you will not get the respect. So there's a lot now uh, about abuse of computers or robots or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And so the only way you can actually get some kind of respect in the sense yeah. of not being abused is that the people somehow has empathy towards you. So yeah. understand, or oh, maybe if I do this, the machine could break. Yeah. 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 Now, yeah. if you're not a consumer at all, mm. perhaps you can't explicate your functional as producer. So you need a minimum 
yeah. they expect, which come from constant. Yeah. Yes. Well, I think, I think people are um, doing quite a lot of research into making um, uh, you know, various kinds of agents um, y you know, attractive and, and um, um, you know, empathetic seeming in, in their, in their behaviour. And, um, and obviously it is important because um, if, one, if one wants people to use them, you want, you've got to make them, you know, so that people want, want to be around and them. For social interaction. Yes, so yes. More accessibility. So yes. But that's not really, um, you know, making them so that they actually are moral consumers. Um, and, and as I said, you know, um, you know Mark Kockelberg, um, <laughs> who's, um, who, whose work I mentioned, says that, that, that in one sense, you know, we might want to consider them as a kind of you know, as having um, ethical uh, demands on us, or at least as having been uh, sort of subjects of some kind of ethical consideration, to the extent to which we naturally do empathise towards us and towards them. And 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 I think there is a lot of evidence that people do um, tend to uh, ident you know, to, to warm towards robots in all sorts of ways, particularly children. And you know, um, I mean, there's been work on with furry robots for for old people and so on. Um, so in a, in a sense, the problem of, of making them seem to be, uh, you know, amiable and empathetic is probably already well look, looked at. The question of whether they can actually be real moral consumers, in, which in my sense means that they would have these ethically engaging states of phenomenal uh, consciousness, I think is a much longer term question. And I think for now, um, you know, people have tried to try to fudge that question and say, well, maybe, you know, who knows really what artificial consciousness is? And, you know, as Turing put it, how do we even know that, you know, someone else is conscious, which I think is a complete, you know, uh, as a really poor response to that <laughs> issue, because we do know, you know, we know. And that's what ethics is based on. Um, so he was just wrong about that. Um, that's my contribution to the Turing debate, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, I think probably most of us would agree that it would be wrong to destroy a beautiful painting, like say the yeah. Mona Lisa. So does that make the Mona Lisa a, a moral consumer? Um, no, no, it doesn't. But it shows that um, that there are there are um, you know um, one can have moral well one can have a kind of respect for something um, without without admitting that it has consciousness. Um, so. Um, you know, I mean, and indeed, one can. There, there are moral questions, or at least we have moral concerns about what to do, for example, with um, the bodies of recently, or the effects of recently deceased people, um, where clearly they're not conscious. But where, and it's not clear what that is based on. To what extent it's rational? Um, to what extent it's it's understandable, um, irrational, uh, or what? But clearly, it's not based upon their, their consciousness here and now. Though many people. Uh, dramatise it in that way. Maybe they're looking down on us and so on and have that kind of a, a view, but clearly it can survive, you know, adopting, you know, rejecting that supernaturalistic kind of approach. So that there are all sorts of contexts where we do have, um, you know, concerns about beings which aren't uh, conscious. And paintings, of course, is another one. And so would robots be. And I think that's all, you know, helps to support uh, Mark's position, Mark Cockleberg's position, that there is this sort of midway um, area, as it were. Um, yeah. One of your messages is urgency. That there's this, you don't proliferate, that there's this impending uh, disaster. Maybe. Well, what I, I, I may have missed it, but what isn't clear is, is what that disaster is. And I, I assume you don't expect us to end up in the Matrix or in the Terminator movies type of disaster at some point. Well, what I, I don't know, and I don't necessarily think it's one disaster. It may be a whole series of... I mean, is there one disaster in the production of, of the horseless carriage, the, the proliferation of the horseless carriage? Uh, maybe there's a whole series of disasters. You know. what, is, what is your expectation? What is this uh, doom that we're facing? Well, I'm not sure that I, I'd call it a doom, but, but it... it, it um, um, I, I mean, I, I think there's a whole... There's a variety of different things. You put me on the spot here, so I'll try and think of some of the things um, very quickly. Well, one is that we, we, we use imperfect ethical models. Um, so um, there are all sorts of things missing from those models which make them you know, not really very effective 
at um, you know um, w working in in concrete situations. Another is that the models, though they're 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 they're, they're quite full, um, they're actually unpredictable in, in what decisions they give, and they just turn out to give different decisions from the ones that we would naturally give. You know, when we've put as much done as much work as we practically can to uh, build in all the fine fine texture of, of human moral decisions, they still end up, you know, just um, in in weird sort of ways. Just as you know, web designers who try to think about what real human beings uh, using web their websites actually think like, you know, just consistently end up, um, you know, failing to do that. So, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I. I, I was paying someone a sum of money through my electronic, you know, bank uh, website, and I paid it twice. And I had a conversation with the the guy at the, um, you know, the the, uh, the tech guy um, on the helpline, and he said, "Well, you know, you should have seen the, you know, this or that screen, which clearly said da da da." And I said, "Well, if it, you know, if I didn't do it, it didn't. It clearly didn't clearly say that because he, you know." So his assumption about. And, and I think a similar thing, a similar mismatch may occur in, in how uh, these so-called ethical machines might decide from, and they might, be, you know, so that could lead to a number of weird and possibly disastrous results. And clearly in, in you know, in contexts like warfare or, you know, safety critical situations or blind driving where you sit there and, you know, get on with your email while the, you know, the car drives itself, that could be quite tough, you know, if... Uh, mistakes, um, you know, a wrong turning. I mean, my, you know, uh, Google Maps consistently tells people to go to the end of the road, of my road, if, you, if it wants to go in an easterly direction and uh, cross um, a pedestrian bridge over a train line. Um, you know, but that's a matter of fact, not ethics. OK, um, that's a you know, failure of a, a fact. The GPS system just has not been properly up, you know, was wrongly set up. So. I think we can we ascribe the notion of moral production to merely passive objects and think about an example like a wedding ring that might remind us to be uh, maritally faithful and if so are we in danger of confusing think over ascribing ethical obligations to things merely on behalf of them being active rather than passive? Well, um, <clears throat> that's a very interesting question. So um, that was my way of saying, let me think about it for a minute or two. Um, so a, a, a wedding ring, as you've described it, isn't really a moral producer because um, it doesn't have a responsibility. Um, and it, you, you can't really ethically evaluate its, um, um, well, its role um, in the sense that it, it oughtn't to be doing what it's doing. I mean, maybe, um, you know, I might say to it, you know, damn you, you know, here I am trying to, you know, be unfaithful to my wife and have an affair, and you're sitting there making me feel guilty, you know, and throw it into the drawer or something. Um, but I'm not, you know, that, that's anthropomorphizing. So I think my, I'm, I'm not really tempted to go down your route. Um, but, you know, try and try me again sometime. With a different example. Yeah. We've got time. For, well, we'll get into. So, what, one here, sir. Yeah. Assuming you succeed, <coughs> or the people doing this kind of research succeed beyond their wildest dreams and come up with an ethical system that makes excellent judgments all the time, and they yeah. sell it to the Air Force, mm -hmm. well, wouldn't the Air Force just tweak it a little bit to do what they really wanted it to do? Uh, how, how can you make sure that it stays ethical? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. And that, that's another answer to your question. <laughs> yeah. But. Um, I w I'm just wondering, maybe in the future, maybe in the next 50 years, we have the opportunity to leave some intelligent companions, which may just probably live at your home, giving suggestions about dinner choices, or maybe some any other uh, house suggestions, or maybe any other storytelling situation for the young children, or maybe help um, Older people about um, some something in the house, uh, or maybe help them about any kind of um, how they living style suggestion, or probably um, help them to send emails, etc., or send any other um, 
urgency messages to the family member, I think they might be treated as a like uh, our pets, like um, one of the family member. So I don't know because they, um, they they they've been treated as a family member, and we um, probably have a lot of privacy or those kind of confidential information or maybe preferences. Yes. And the robot might understand them quite well. Yes. I don't know. Maybe we have a visitor from the neighbor or any friend coming in, and the agent will tell everything out or not. So I don't know if there's any kind of um, maybe strategy or maybe kind of um, thinking currently in order to pr probably help us, or help, help the agent to protect our privacy, confidential, those yeah. kind of things. Yeah, I think that's a really, you know, I think, I think, I mean, I have to say I didn't hear some of what you said because the acoustics weren't, aren't that good, but um, I think I got the general idea. I mean, you're thinking about a household a um, agent which, um, you know, ha enters quite intimately and in all sorts of ways into into sort of various private familial relationships and you know is party to various sorts of confidential inform information and so on and maybe it can be quite sensitively tuned to the dynamics of the household um, you know and I'm sure that sort of thing w will I mean that seems to be a very plausible uh, sort of route um, and probably and, and in that case it could be a quite benign route you can imagine these things um, developing in a fairly limited way and then gradually getting uh, you know perfected in, in fairly safe increments and I think that that's quite a good counter example if you like to my Jeremiah type you know uh, concerns about you know uh, ethical scaffolding to technologies um, so I like I like what you say very much